makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Good morning and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Tom McKenzie in London with the conversations that matter. And here's what's coming up on today's programme. Japan's two-year yields jump to its highest in more than a decade after inflation comes in hot. Traders now bet there is an 80% chance that negative rates will end by April. Sheen could consider listing in London if the fast fashion retailer doesn't get approval for a US IPO. Plus, French President Emmanuel Macron says sending Western troops to Ukraine cannot be ruled out. That's as Sweden gets final approval to join NATO. Let's check in on these markets then. Of course, it is a big week on the data front. We are looking ahead to the inflation print out of the U.S. on Thursday. It's a little bit muted in terms of the picture across the European map so far today. After the losses of yesterday, you're currently looking at the European stock 600. The benchmark, of course, down just a tenth of a percent. The FTSE 100 is flat. There have been some gains in the early part of the session on the mining story and the upside that's coming through in terms of iron ore prices. But for now, the FTSE 100 trading at 7,681. A little bit of optimism coming through on the DAX over in Germany. Gains of two tenths of a percent. And the FTSE movement in Italy just adding a tenth of a percent. Let's flip the board and look cross-asset then. The currency at the moment is the Japanese yen on the back of the strength that came through on the inflation picture. A little bit of gain coming through, slightly above the estimates. And again, you saw those yields on the front end, on those two-year yields, up to the highest level in about a decade in Japan. Again, as markets start to reassess where the BOJ goes in terms of ending its ultra-loose policy. Is it March? March is possibly now a live meeting. Currently, you're looking at 150 on the Japanese yen, currently up three-tenths of a percent. US two-year currently at 468. The yields have been up a little bit yesterday on the back of a Treasury auction. Yields currently down two to three basis points. You are seeing a bit of money moving in into the U.S. Treasury market so far in the market session this Tuesday. Brent seeming to find some kind of floor at $82 a barrel, $82.45 right now, just down a tenth of a percent. And Bitcoin, 56297 just below 57000 It crossed through that level for the first time since about the end of 2021. Those flows into those crypto ETFs have been pretty pronounced, and you're seeing some further upside there, gains of 3% for Bitcoin. Let's get back to the markets, though, in terms of what's happening on the inflation front and the expectation around the Fed. Let's bring in Lucy Baldwin, Global Head of Research and Equity Advisory at Citigroup. We'll also get Lucy's views on the Japanese markets as well. Lucy, thank you very much for joining us in the studio this Tuesday morning. Let's start with the expectations then around the Fed pricing as we lead up to that inflation print on Thursday. The expectation still markets pricing just under four cuts from the Federal Reserve. The dot plots, of course, had forecast three cuts this year. If we get a hotter-than-expected print when it comes to PCE on Thursday, how vulnerable are these markets? Good morning, Tom. Thanks for having me. Yes, big question. And from our perspective, as you say, we've gone from one extreme where we were looking for seven cuts mm -hmm. at one point all the way into now three cuts broadly being priced by markets. Our view is really that the Fed is going to be much, much more cautious and that the risk here is that you continue to see this fairly hot data in the U.S., particularly driven by services inflation, hot labor markets that are really still very tight in a number of places. So our expectation is that you're not going to see cuts coming through till June. Mm -hmm. However, we do take the view that you're going to see around 125 basis of cuts, and that's predicated by a technical recession that we expect to see in the U.S. as we go through. So into it's the later, but half. it's more cuts. And am I right, right. thinking 125 basis points of cuts then by the end of this year, but you don't think they start until June? And you still have flagged a recession in the U.S. What gets us to a, re a recession in the U.S., given that we are seeing on a number of data points continued resilience in that economy? Yes, and we're getting that question a lot, as you might well imagine. And as you say, we also had quite an optimistic view, um, you know, last year mm -hmm. in many, many ways. And we obviously saw great data coming through last year into the start of this year. Why do we think it's going to slow? Really, there's three things that mm -hmm. we think are going to slow in the U.S. dynamic. One is that rates are actually going to bite. Like, the longer these rates stay at these levels with inflation coming down, the real rates obviously going up, that's really starting to bite. We see those cracks in parts of the consumer, in parts of the real estate market coming through. And the longer it stays like this, 
the more it's going to bite. Really, we got it a bit wrong because we thought you'd see this recession earlier. We thought you'd see it last year, well, like alone. many people. You weren't alone. Yeah. Exactly. And ultimately, the consumers, the corporates, they locked in, they turned out their debt, and it's taken lo longer than we'd have expected to manifest. The second thing, really, is the fiscal impulse we think is going to be an awful lot less, not just for the US, around the world, despite, obviously, half the world's population going to the polls. That fiscal space just isn't there to really stimulate uh, to the degree we obviously saw coming out of the pandemic. Hmm. And then the third point is just this services piece, right? Coming out of the pandemic again, you saw this big rotation out of goods into services. Everyone went out to their favorite restaurants, off on holiday, and you saw services running incredibly hot around the world, but particularly in the US. And we think that is really going to be moderating. So that's what's giving us the conviction of the slowing this year. Yeah. And that's why we're below consensus for growth in the US and also globally. But what is it about that, really, that triggers us into recession? And for us, that's a real debate, and it's mm -hmm. quite a fine line, Tom, candidly, um, is around what is making that slowdown um, dynamic come through from a jobs perspective. Do you get the conventional demand destruction, mm -hmm. people losing their jobs, that side of things triggering a recession? Or can you see the US labour market, as Team Soft Landing believe you can, expand to the point that enables you to see wage pressures moderating without unemployment going up, and i.e. participation rates and cohorts of the market increasing, mm. but also the immigration dynamic that we're seeing in the US um, expanding that supply of labour. And can those things enable this soft landing of the plane? But we think it's just hmm. too early to call that victory okay. over inflation. Because that, because that is, you're right, that is part of the debate. Because one, one view is, if you start getting cuts from the Fed, that's because the economy is doing badly. That's because the economy is moving into a recession. And actually, cutting from the Fed in that environment is going to be worse for these equity markets than what we're currently seeing. And, of course, the earnings story is part of it, AI is part of it. But they have powered through, in the US particularly, the strength that's come through across the equity markets despite these higher rates. How, yes. do, how do you land on that debate? Well, as you say, there's this bit of a Goldilocks expectation out there that is forming that you can see quite a big magnitude of cuts, but without any real sort of slowdown in terms of growth dynamics. And that, of course, is the challenge. So, you know, if you think about our view of the S&P, obviously last year was a phenomenal year for the S&P. 26, 27% growth. That was 60% driven yeah. by the Magnificent Seven, as we know. We've come into this year, and our call has been this sort of broadening out of earnings growth. So we broadens out, it doesn't top out. For Correct. The we we do forward. still see some upside, although our base case, the upside is really not significant. 5,100 on the S&P. Exactly. But the bull case is 5,700. Correct. And to get there, you've got to see $260 of earnings. You've got to see 23 times of earnings, so mm. a multiple expansion. Now, look, for us, valuation isn't everything here at these levels. It's absolutely fair to say that in 90% of history, uh, the S&P has been cheaper. So valuation is definitely at the high end. It's in that 10th decile from a uh, valuation perspective overall. But when you use that looking forward, it's very rarely the right uh, proxy to think about returns in the next 12 months. Mm. What matters much more is earnings momentum, mm -hmm. which is a big theme, obviously, and, of course, flows and the positioning side of things in the market, as well as the rates piece. So we wouldn't use valuation as a reason to sell the S&P here. And, in fact, we do see in that Goldilocks scenario some quite substantial upside still to come. But, yes, we do think there's this broadening out th thesis that needs to come through as well. Tom. OK, and that earnings strength, we've seen that in the US, and one of the other developed markets where we've seen it pronounced is Japan as well, and stocks there the Nikkei up about 40% in the last 12 months. We had the inflation data out of Japan coming in slightly higher than expected. That maybe brings forward the move from the Bank of Japan to end that ultra-loose monetary policy. Does that fade, does that dull the story for Japanese equities, or do you still want to be adding in terms of your portfolio management? Yes, we are still pretty bullish on Japanese equities. Mm. We still see 15% upside from here. And Further 15% upside. From here. And okay. as you say, quite rightly, Tom, the interesting thing with Japan uh, is there had been that expectation today that we drop below that 2% mm -hmm. threshold, having been there, I think, you know, 2% or more since, obviously, March 22. And was that going to kill the story, this thesis of inflation coming back and, as you say, lift off then potentially for the Bank of Japan from as early as March, April this year? And our view is that that thesis has got room to run. And the reason for that is when you think about the Japanese equity market in particular, right, if you go back to, as you say, you know, 30-odd years to 1989 mm -hmm. to the last sort of peak, when you looked at it, it was an incredibly expensive market optically. That is no longer the case. So that valuation adjustment from 30-odd years ago has absolutely happened in Japan and is a very compelling valuation story now. 
Secondly, and quite critically, the earnings story is incredibly strong. If you look at Japan corporate earnings, from the mid-2010s even, there's been this really remarkable recovery that's kind of gone under the radar screen to some degree in the sense that um, the reform agenda in Japan has really transformed things. And much more recently as well, you've seen use of cash, you've seen you know, uh, balance sheet discipline, you've seen share buybacks, you've seen dividends, etc. And that has meant that Japan has actually been, from an earnings growth perspective, over now quite a long period of time, a remarkably good story in a global context. And I guess the third piece of that is when you look at the economy, you know, all of that has happened mm -hmm. while inflation has obviously been challenged. Now we've got a bit of inflation back. We think this story can actually get even better from here and that that's going to support the earnings growth. And in turn, that can enable further re-rating from a valuation perspective. Okay. Hence our confidence that it's not too late and you can indeed still well, party it, like it's 1989. Love it. Still party <laughs> like it's 1989, but with better fundamentals, arguably. It's, it's, and it's not, it's not a flash in the Japan, uh, for Japan. Um, Lucy Baldwin, thank you very much indeed on the case for Japanese stocks and also, of course, the view on inflation, the trajectory there and what that could mean, of course, for Fed policy going forward. The case there, the view that you still are facing a technical recession in the second half of this year for the US economy. Lucy Baldwin, Citigroup's Global Head of Research and Equity Advisory. Coming up is London calling for Sheen. We take a look at why the fast fashion brand is preparing for not making the cut in New York, what that could mean for London's markets. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now, Bloomberg has learned that fast fashion company Shein is considering the possibility of switching its IPO to London. That's uh, reportedly because of hurdles to a US listing. Let's get the details then and bring in Bloomberg's Sophia Hortari Costa for the latest on this. Is this then, Sophia, a long awaited win for the UK markets? Potentially. I mean, uh, being a choice, is, even if you're second choice or third choice, is better than being no take, choice. We will take it at this point. We will take it. This is not a tech company, but it's mm. a big name, and it's a name that's trying to kind of make inroads um, in the UK. It bought Misguided mm. uh, last year. It tried to buy Topshop a few years ago, losing out to ASOS. It had a pop-up store on Oxford Street. Um, so really uh, kind of building the relationship here. We know that the founder uh, met with some city executives when he was here uh, in December. Um, if this is a win for London, and there's a lot of ifs here because the U.S. is still first choice. There's regulatory hurdles, but also political pressure. Marco Rubio being one of the senators that's pushing against us because it is, even though it's not based uh, in China, it is a Chinese founded company. Um, and that's not a very uh, politically popular um, uh, thing to, to welcome into New York at a time uh, when the U.S. is preparing for elections. But you know, this would be a big win for London. It would be a big company. Um, I was calculating even at the lowest valuation, it would be about the 17th biggest company mm. in the UK were it to list here at, at current valuations. Um, so, you know, and, and it's, you know, it's a big name. It's a big brand. I'm interested in why Xi'an's not looking at Hong Kong, because that would be normally the second choice if, if uh, Chinese founded companies can't get New York. Um, so if London yeah. starts to be an alternative to, to Hong Kong, that's another story altogether. OK, that's one worth dig digging into then, potentially. Meanwhile, here, here in the UK, we're seeing a little bit of easing in terms of, in terms of grocery prices, at least prices in shops. What, what are the dynamics that we're seeing at play there? Slight race to the bottom in terms of price. So it's becoming incredibly competitive among grocers, supermarkets, really wanting to get customers through the door. And that's more important for them right now to gain market share uh, than to get customers to, to spend more. So we did see a bounce back. Valentine's Day did help. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, there was a, little, a slight discounted Valentine's Day, but it did help uh, versus January. But this is adding to inflation in all seriousness, uh, adding to evidence that inflation is coming down. Um, the, the numbers for January were lower than expected. Retail sales picked up from a very, very miserable uh, December as well. So this is good news. I mean, things are moving in the right direction. We did actually see a little bit of a market reaction with gilts outperforming uh, bonds and, and treasuries, and that might be because of the disinflationary story here in the UK. That's really interesting. Yeah, you're seeing a three basis point move lower at the front end and on the 10 year uh, here in the UK on, on gilts on the back then, possibly of that slightly softer shop inflation coming through for the 
UK. Sophia Horta, of course, thank you very much indeed. With the eco data in terms of the inflation trajectory and, of course, the news around Xi'an potentially looking at the UK as a listing destination. Coming up, we're going to discuss commercial real estate and the risks to the euro. We will speak to the managing director of the European Stability Mechanism, the institution which protected the currency during the financial crisis. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now, Germany's ratio of bad loans in commercial property is increasing, putting a spotlight on the potential for a slow motion crash. It would pose a major risk to German lenders who are more exposed to commercial real estate, more exposed than most of their European peers. And according to one study, extended loans more aggressively. Let's discuss this and other topics and bring in the head of the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism. Pierre Gromenia is the managing director of the ESM. Pierre, we'll talk about why you're here in London as well in a minute. But let's start with the commercial real estate yeah. challenges that we are seeing. We've seen them in the US. We've seen the impact there. We've done some Bloomberg reporting that's out today in terms of the pressures, the linkages between German banks and the commercial real estate. And maybe because of some arcane accounting rules that we haven't come to fully realise the extent of that exposure. How concerned are you about a potential crisis when it comes to commercial real estate in the Eurozone? Well, the commercial real estate issue as risk uh, is well known in the United States mm -hmm. and uh, also in Europe, which is due to the fact that interest rates went up so quickly. So that's a situation uh, that could only have consequences on commercial real estate. Uh, if I focus more on Europe, uh, I would say that most countries have issues, but it all depends if you have flexible interest rates or fixed interest rate. So I, I wouldn't have a, a, a general view on it. We monitor it also as ESM because obviously we are there to ensure financial stability or prevent uh, a crisis. So yeah. we obviously follow this. But as of now, I think uh, this uh, issue, which was on the radar since the interest rates went up in all countries, uh, has not materialized spectacularly. So you wouldn't characterize it as a crisis right now, but right. you are focused on this risk? Exactly. OK. Does there need to be more transparency around how German lenders account for their exposure to I, commercial real estate? I, I wouldn't focus on German lenders. I think the, the issue is everywhere and we need to have a global view on this. That's what we do yeah. uh, as the uh, safety mechanism or the one that safeguards the euro area. We look at all the countries because we are uh, a, a Europe, that, a united Europe, so you have to have all the interlinkages also. But for, for now you are confident that you have the clarity and the transparency into the linkages between CRE, commercial real estate, and, and banks more broadly then across the Eurozone. You yes. have that lens, do you? We, we, we look into that and we're yeah. not the only ones. Sure. OK. So talk to us about why you are here in, in London then. What is, what is the purpose of, of your visit here? What are you trying to achieve? Well, uh, the, the ESM uh, has uh, uh, bonds outstanding and refinancing uh, to the tune of closely to 300 billion euro. Mm. So we refinance that on a regular basis. And uh, we are here in London because it's an important financial centre yeah. and also because uh, the United Kingdom has been a steady investor uh, in DSM since the beginning and it's increasing over time. As we speak, more than 20% of our bonds uh, are held by uh, UK and Switzerland. It gives you an idea hmm. of the size. Is, is the appetite still there in yes. this environment? Yes, it's quite good. And, uh, we have been on, on the market since the beginning of the year as ESM and yep. uh, it was quite positive. OK. Italy's government hasn't yet ratified the ESM reform. Do you have a time frame? Do you expect that to happen before the European elections? Well, uh, it, it can mechanically not happen before the European Parliament elections mm -hmm. because it has been presented to the, European, to the Italian Parliament in December uh, with a negative vote. So. Uh, for the Italian constitution, you need to wait for six months before you present it uh, again. And so uh, I think there's still a lot of explanations to do uh, in Italy. And also, in fact, uh, in the first year in office uh, uh, last year, uh, I have visited all the member countries of uh, the euro area, which are the members uh, yeah. of the European stability mechanism, to see how 
uh, DSM can best respond to the needs that we have today. We have different types of crisis today than those that triggered the existence of the ESM, which was the sovereign debt crisis. And at that time, we had in mind such types of crisis. Yeah. And now we've had COVID, now we have the, the war in Ukraine and, and politic, geopolitical instability, to say the least. Now we have the war at our doorstep. So yeah. obviously, everyone is looking into how different institutions can best respond. Yes, because, the, because the Italians, of course, it's the stigma around austerity, the linkages between exactly. austerity and the ESM that, that, is a, that is a political concern Concern there. You, you mentioned the war in Ukraine. Oli, Oli Ren, uh, of course, formerly a consequential role across the Eurozone uh, and a former EU Economic Affairs sure. Commission, has said the ESM should be a plan B in terms of Europe's assistance to Ukraine. Would it be open to that? Now, first, you have to realise that uh, our mandate is, is to help the 20 member states in yeah. the euro area. We cannot help a country outside our remit. But obviously, we could indirectly help uh, if some countries have issues that are triggered by the war in Ukraine or would have problems accessing the market, we could uh, try to help them. And not only if there's a deep crisis, but also to prevent a crisis. Okay. So we can help our members. Pierre Grimenia, thank you very much indeed. We appreciate your time this morning. Managing Director of the European Stability Mechanism. Much more to come. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now, Japan's two-year yield jumps to its highest in more than a decade after inflation comes in hot. Traders now bet there is an 80% chance negative rates will end by April. Shein could consider listing in London if the fast fashion retailer doesn't get approval for a US IPO. Plus, French President Emmanuel Macron says sending Western troops to Ukraine cannot be ruled out as Sweden gets final approval to join NATO. Good morning and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Tom McKenzie here in London. Let's go to that story then. Sweden is set to join NATO within days after Hungary's parliament finally approved Stockholm's accession. The go-ahead comes months after Sweden submitted its membership bid alongside Finland in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. For more on this, I'm joined by Bloomberg's Oliver Crook, who's on the ground for us in Berlin. Oli, it has, to say the least, been a complicated road for Sweden then to get to this point. How significant is the extension to NATO for Stockholm and for the alliance? Right, complicated and long, right? This is almost two years to the day since the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And this is something that was held up initially by Turkey and then by Hungary. And it seems that the path to NATO is paved in, perhaps appropriately, fighter jets. It was agreements to sell fighter jets to both Hungary and to Turkey that seemed to finally clinch it. And now Sweden will be poised to be the 32nd member of NATO in the coming days. And this is significant because Sweden has historically been quite skeptical of this sort of alliance politically, but also within the population. That obviously changed two years ago. And it also changes a sort of policy within Sweden of sort of non-alignment militarily. They have not been in a war since 1814. So really a significant change there. And when you look at it geostrategically, look at the map there in front of you, it's a huge player in the Baltic Sea. They have very advanced submarines, home to Saab, which makes the fighter jets that Hungary wanted to get their, um, their hands on. And so from that perspective, also significant Saab, which by the way, hit an all-time high yesterday, probably in part because of all this, hmm. but also financially, right? Finland has got that huge border with Russia. However, Sweden's economy is twice as big, and that means 2% of that, of GDP, eventually will be going to NATO defense spending now. Okay, and as we say, this was the, the catalyst, of course, was Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine, and we've been hearing Macron convening European leaders in, in Paris to kind of try to rally support for Ukraine. Did, did he ultimately succeed? So I think he's managed to rally, you know, additional goodwill. The problem that there is here with Europe mm. and Ukraine is that there is no shortage of goodwill. What there is a shortage of is ammunition and capacity to actually produce that ammunition. And that was really kind of at the heart of the question there. Maybe they're going to source some of it from outside of Europe. It seems that that idea is getting more traction. The Czechs have proposed this, and now the Dutch and the French say they are on board. But I think the headline for many people will be what Emmanuel Macron said about the potentiality of troops on the ground in Ukraine. Have a listen. There is no consensus today to officially, openly, and with endorsement, send troops on the ground. 
But in terms of dynamics, nothing should be ruled out. We will do everything necessary to ensure that Russia cannot win this war. So Emmanuel Macron saying nothing should be ruled out, and that is in part, we have to assume, because of the big question that's hanging over everything, the United States, you still have uh, tens of billions of dollars in aid stuck in the House that is not making any progress. Biden is convening congressional leaders today to try to get that through. But then there's also the other big question, Tom, that is the potential for a Trump presidency who has spoken very disparagingly about NATO. What that means in terms of policy is not entirely clear, but it could mean a more leaky U.S. security umbrella over NATO. OK, Bloomberg's Oliver Crook with the latest there on the question of NATO and, of course, that support for Ukraine, that ongoing uh, support. Ollie, thank you very much indeed. Coming up, we're going to be joined by the CEO. We're going to switch focus and joined by the CEO of Techno Gym. Uh, we're going to explore how AI is changing the health and wellness sector. That is coming up. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now, Technogym shares falling close to 6.4% this morning in Milan, the most since July 2022, after Banker Acros cut its recommendation to sell on expectation of disappointing results for 2023. It comes as the company tries to stay at the forefront of innovation in health and wellness, including, of course, the boom in artificial intelligence. There's also something of the Paris Olympics to be thinking about as well. Joining me now is Nerio Alessandri, the CEO and chairman of Technogym, of course, the founder of this business. Nerio, thank you very much for joining us in, in the studio. Let, let's go to that point then around, around the demand, around the outlook. What are, what are you seeing for 2024? How is, how is the demand picture shaping up for you? Thank you. Uh, yes, we are very positive for this year because the wellness, the healthy lifestyle, the prevention is the new priority for mm -hmm. everybody. Mm -hmm. Technology is a leader in the fitness, health and sport, smart equipment in terms of ecosystem. And thanks to the artificial intelligence today, we have the possibility to customize and personalize the program. And technology is a personalized wellness lifestyle in the holistic approach in terms of nutrition, training, precision training, yep. and the mental approach. So the, down, the downgrade that we saw today is pegged to the idea that you're going to have to spend more on OPEX, operational expenditures, in order to stay ahead when it comes to innovation. Are, is there more that you... How much spending are you going to have to put aside? Is that a fair view on what's going to have to unfold for you and the business to stay ahead in innovation? Are you going to have to spend, step up that level of spending? Yes, technology means the long-term approach in terms of uh, a sustainable uh, profit uh, and uh, sustainable uh, growth. We invest a lot of money in the last yeah. two years. It's the record for technology in terms of investment in uh, digital transformation, in Internet of Things development. That, that level of investment continues, or are you going to have to go above that? No, we invest in the last two years. Yeah. This included, but in now we would like to capitalize the investment. We would like to create the future. We build the future. Mm -hmm. And now we have a very, very positive uh, prevision for the future. Okay, very anecdotally, after COVID, I've seen a lot of friends getting rid of their running machines or their cycling machines at home and getting outside. They want to be running in parks, they want to be running through London. Are you seeing a shift in terms of that demand for your devices? But today, the new approach is the hybrid, not only at home, okay. not only in the club. Means uh, technology many time, anywhere, mm -hmm. wellness on the go. Means uh, variety, Pe people, they like the variety. Sometime at home, sometime in the, in the, in the, during the work time, in a club, in the free time. It depends. Yeah. Because it's the culture. The wellness is the culture. The wellness is the mindset. The wellness is the education. Mm -hmm. In terms of prevention, healthy lifestyle. In terms of sport performance, in terms of uh, energy. But first of all, in terms of uh, entertainment lifestyle. You've got a big exposure here in the UK market. What are the other priority markets for you? The other growth markets as you look ahead this year? Now we have amazing growth, amazing opportunities in the Middle East. Technology signed a contract with NEO. NEO is the new city, the smart mm -hmm. city, the wellness city. We have many projects in the Middle East. There are all in Saudi Arabia 800 new hotels, 800 new hotels in the next five years. But still very good also the Asia Pacific because there is the new opportunity. 
in terms of uh, new countries. India is an amazing new opportunity, India, but in the next two, three years also Africa, Nigeria, Angola, because the North Africa, because Africa is the new frontier for everybody. Okay, interesting. There's a lot of components that go into your devices. But the U.S. is still the biggest market. Okay, U.S. still the biggest market. When it, when it comes to inflation, input costs, what are you seeing there? Where is, where is the stickiness most, most acute when it comes to all the inputs that go into your, into your machines? Okay, uh, we manage the price because we manage the value for mm -hmm. money approach. Technology means quality, is premiumness, uh, and in the home we are luxury living. Yeah. The pricing, we are pricing power, and we don't have problem in terms of pricing. We have, first of all, problem in terms of opportunity about go to market. We need to build the future. Building our future is our must because we need to create the culture, culture in terms of prevention. Exercise is medicine, yeah. and we need to share with the health care system in terms of health is wealth. Health is good for companies to increase um, productivities. It's very important for government to reduce their cost, but it's very important but for people to increase it, to improve the quality still, of you life. You still have pricing power in this environment. Exactly. We and are, you, you, can, you can put up prices further from here if you need to. First of all, means uh, education and then the price. First of all, is to create the needs to yeah. share the value added with operators, with end users, and then uh, is the price is important. How are you integrating AI into your business, maybe to create efficiencies, but also into your products? Yes, we started 30 years ago to develop software, the first uh, training software. Today, we have uh, more or less 25 million people inside our My Wellness Cloud, is the ecosystem, and 55 million of people, they use technology every day. 55 million, they use technology every day. And then our goal is to connect, to connect in the ecosystem wellness connected experience. Okay. When it comes to the, Olymp the Paris Olympics later this year, this summer, going to be held in the French capital and around other regions of France, how much of a catalyst could that be for your, for your business to the top line? Yes, uh, we are technology is official supplier for the last eight edition, mm -hmm. and then also Paris 2024. 13,000 artists will use technology in, in uh, July, uh, August. For us, it's very important line the automotive for the Formula One. The Formula One for us is the Olympic Games. We have feedback from athletes, champions. Uh, we have the lab, thanks to this experience, because 26 training centers in Paris, uh, they use technology for 4,000 smart uh, equipment mm -hmm. and then we have relations with doctors sports doctors physiotherapists federation for 20 220 countries do you see a sales spike a sales spike after and on the back not of the olympics the, are not you the expecting spike that? in the short term mm -hmm. because the olympic games is the opportunity for the long term okay because it's not the consumer mm, style yeah is the business to business style but uh, when we have the endorsement from the champions around the world the credibility of the brand is very very important okay Nero, thank you very much indeed for your time certainly not lacking energy uh, this morning Nero alessandri ceo and chairman of techno gym of course now, switching focus as the WTO meets in Abu Dhabi this week. The EU's trade chief says the world needs to preserve rules-based trade. Valdis Dombrovskis spoke exclusively to Bloomberg from the conference. We are currently certainly in a more conflictual geopolitical situations than we were before. Uh, there uh, is uh, uh, growing tendencies towards uh, protectionism. We risk economic fragmentation. So we need to address uh, all of this, and uh, therefore we need to uh, preserve the role of the WTO and rules-based multilateral trading system. Okay, European Trade Commission of Aldis Dombrovsky is speaking to Bloomberg a little earlier. Meanwhile, the head of the World Trade Organization says global commerce is performing weaker than forecast amid multiple economic headwinds and a political tilt towards protectionism. She was speaking at the WTO conference in Abu Dhabi. Let's bring in at this point Eric Martin, who joins us from Abu Dhabi with the latest. What have been, Eric, good morning. Thanks for joining us. What have people been talking about at the conference? What have been the hot topics? What is grabbing people's attention? Is this an organization that can ultimately be reformed? Good morning, Tom. Well, that is the big question. We've seen a strong push by the U.S. as well as other governments to try to 
update the WTO and to keep it relevant. This was a, an organization that uh, for a number of years hadn't seen a new agreement completed. Uh, everyone is very excited about an agreement that is set to enter force once it reaches about two-thirds of WTO members enacting it, which is on fishing subsidies, trying to preserve the fishing stock in the ocean, uh, which the WTO chief has mentioned is 50 percent overexploited at this point. So thinking an issue that combines both people's livelihood for hundreds of millions of people as well as the environment, um, but really trying to see how do you in an era in which the U.S. and China, their geopolitical rivalry, geostrategic rivalry is so defining. How do you keep 166 members marching to the same beat? And that's that's a common ground that WTO members and that the director general are looking for this week here in Abu Dhabi. Yeah, interesting. Well, look, Eric, you follow all of this really, really closely, kind of at a granular level. You're at the event covering it for us. What, what are the big risks? You nodded to it. Is, is the big risk the rift ultimately between China and the U.S., or is it something else when it comes to the shape of global trade going forward? Well, certainly the U.S.-China uh, rivalry is, uh, is front of mind for policymakers in the trade space, but also some issues that haven't been uh, on, the, uh, on the radar, um, you know, just even uh, six months ago. When you look at the WTO forecast was actually made two days prior to the Hamas attack in Israel. And so given all of the tensions that have uh, escalated from that, talking about the Houthis and the, uh, and, uh, the Red Sea and Yemen and all of these conflicts um, that haven't been present in people's minds that have come as a as a big shock to the global trading system and so trying to navigate all of those challenges as well they were already dealing with the war in ukraine and the impact on uh, for instance grain shipping around the world and on food supply and so adding that to that the conflict in israel and the uh, the tension in the Middle East really makes a complicated backdrop for policymakers. Some of the issues that are being dealt with here are things that have been looked at before. We have an e-commerce moratorium that prohibits tariffs mm. on uh, digital transfers, things like movies that somebody might download or uh, music, books. And so that's something that they're looking to renew. A lot of people are looking at that as a potential sign of whether this organization can still function, whether they can roll over again, something that's been renewed every couple of years since the late 1990s. OK, we certainly watch for that development. Absolutely. Eric Martin on the ground for us in Abu Dhabi at those WTO meetings. We appreciate it. Now, coming up, scientists are puzzled by a spike in fatal heart disease since the COVID-19 pandemic. We discuss with our global health correspondent the details. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Now, four years after the start of the pandemic, a disturbing pattern is emerging. Not only did COVID result in the most deaths in a century, but it also triggered deadly waves of heart disease and stroke. Scientists are trying to figure out why. Let's bring in our global health correspondent, Michelle Cortez. She's just finished a special Q&A on the top live function of the terminal, taking a range of questions on COVID and heart problems. The reporting that Michelle and her team have done is really important on this. Thanks for joining us then on the details. What do we know? We know, of course, that millions were killed by COVID, but now this new research that you've been reporting on suggesting that heart disease deaths also jumped during the pandemic. What do we know? What are the details? Right. Well, you have to remember that heart disease has been the leading cause of death for, for decades at this point. But we were doing really well before COVID came along. Those numbers were declining. And in fact, cancer rates were rising. Then COVID hit and the numbers were you know, astronomical, how many people died. And so you would have thought that you'd switched out one for the other, right? That COVID deaths were replacing some of these heart disease deaths, especially because the people who were dying from COVID were older and in many cases sick. But that's not what actually was found. In fact, 
In the U.S., for example, just over the th first three years of the pandemic, there were a quarter of a million additional deaths in adults age 35 and older. So we saw not only the COVID deaths that didn't exist prior to 2020, we also saw a surge in these heart disease deaths. So we weren't trading off one for the other, and that's something that we're continuing to see going forward. What, was it just heart disease rates that were worsened by COVID, or were there other ailments that were pressured by this pandemic and this yeah. disease? You know, COVID was terrible for every part of your body. We saw increases in diabetes. We saw increases in stroke. We saw increases in atrial fibrillation and even things you wouldn't normally tie to something like an infectious disease. We were seeing more Alzheimer's disease, for example, and even cancer. So absolutely COVID was bad mm. all around every part of our bodies. Uh, why, why is that? And, and, and what does it mean? And if you were inoculated, if you had the vaccine, were you better protected uh, from, some, from some of those factors? What, what was behind the reason for the uptick in, in all of those different ailments? Right. Such a great question. And that's exactly what scientists are trying to get to the bottom of now. Right. Because, of course, it wasn't just that you, people were getting infected and that infection was killing them. That infection was also doing other things to our health care system, for example. So people weren't doing things like going to the to the doctor. They were not getting the cancer screening that they normally would have. And in some cases, healthcare systems were overwhelmed. So they stopped doing things like just uh, any kind of preventative elective surgeries and other types of, you know, emergency rooms were closed. Everything was overwhelmed. So there was definitely some fallout from that. But also your other question is, is also a very hot topic and that we saw a lot of questions today on our T Live. People want to know how bad were the vaccines? To what extent was that contributing? And the research is really mm. unequivocal on this. There's no doubt that vaccines did cause some harm, but it was far outweighed by the numbers of lives that were saved from the vaccinations. That's the takeaway message, of course, that, that, that doctors, scientists, researchers want everyone to know. Of course, it is troubling if you're the one on the other end had some kind of a bad side effect from a COVID vaccine, just like with any vaccine, sometimes that does happen. But again, those benefits, including saving lives, really did offset the risks. OK, really, really important reporting, really fascinating deep dive into the implications, the continued implications, of course, and fallout of that pandemic. Bloomberg's global health correspondent, Michelle Cortez, thank you very much indeed. Now to some other stories making news this Tuesday. U.S. regulators have faulted Boeing for ineffective procedures and a breakdown in communications between senior management and other staff members. An FAA panel also found what it calls a lack of awareness of Boeing's safety-related metrics among employees. The report comes after a mid-air fuselage blowout in January refocused the spotlight on Boeing's safety issues. Let's check in on one asset that is very much on the move in the session today, and that is Bitcoin. It briefly topped 57,000 US dollars per coin for the first time since towards the end of 2021. This chart shows the volume pickup yesterday as money flowed into those ETFs, those Bitcoin-linked ETFs, and volume surging the most yesterday since the approval of those ETFs by regulators in the U.S. the early part of this year. So the appetite seems to still be there. And, of course, you also have the halving of Bitcoin coming up. That's essentially when you take out Bitcoins out of the system to ensure you remain capped at 21 million. You've also seen MicroStrategy that company, that software company, buying up more Bitcoins as well. All those factors seem to come in to support Bitcoin. The pricing currently at 56600 Up next, Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger and Manus Cranny in New York. This is Bloomberg.